I live in the mountains about 10 miles outside of a small town, near a winding back road highway well known for its many accidents, a lot of which happen to be collisions with animals, deer, small rodents, and sometimes more often than not, mountain lions. I grew up in the country my whole life, so I've seen just about every animal my side of the state has to offer, whether alive or roadkill. Recently, I saw one that I could neither identify or rationalize. My husband and I had stopped by for dinner with his co-workers in town down the winding road from our home. Once it grew close to midnight, I knew we should be getting home. My husband insisted he wanted to stay a little bit longer to have a drink with his buddy. Reluctantly, I agreed he could stay, even though he knows I hate going home late at night by myself. We have about a half a mile of driveway leading to our home, which is blocked off by a padlocked gate. I get paranoid every time I have to get out of my car to unlock the gate pull inside, and then relock the gate behind me. Not that I'm afraid of something attacking me, but way up in the country a wild animal mauling me. The number of mountain lions and bears in our area was definitely above average. I headed back home alone, my husband promising he'd only be out for another hour. I took the dangerous road extra cautiously in the evening. The thick cover of trees surrounding the road made it pitch black. After finally arriving at my road, I hit the gravel fast, eager to get inside. What I saw next made me slam on my brakes so hard I fishtailed a bit and scattered gravel every which way. What I saw barely two feet in front of my car was incomprehensible. It looked almost like a human figure at first. Its ribs stuck out so far it took a barrel shape. It was hunched over, but if it stood up straight it had to be at least eight feet tall. Tufts of matted hair all over its body. What skin shone through appeared to be mangled. Long limbs resembling human arms, but too thin and discolored. Its legs arched like wolves. It had no sign of a human face. The face it had seemed to be a snout that contained a sharp set of canine teeth that shone and snarled at me. My eyes locked with its piercing yellow eyes. It stared me down for what felt like an eternity. Then all of a sudden it broke our gaze, swiftly disappearing into the woods. I was so scared I sat in my car until my husband arrived home after an hour later. He had to knock on my window to get my attention. He questioned me about it once we were in the safety of our own home. I've been dealing with paranormal experiences with spirits since I was a child, but my husband says he has never seen me this shook up before. I'll take a ghost over that creature any day. This is a story I was told by one of the other guides who had spent around six years guiding canoe trips in the Lake of the Woods. Let's call him Steven. I want to remind you that I did not experience this, but Steven had told me about a few experiences he and the other guides he worked with had. What I do want you to know is that we do not joke around about wendigos or skinwalkers at our workplace. We do not tell these stories to our campers anymore, and we don't even say their name but refer to them only as W or S. This is not something that we joke about or just make up to scare campers. I'm not an expert in wendigos or skinwalkers or Native American culture by any means, and I hope not to offend anyone, but the knowledge that I have on them has been passed down by guides and their experiences. One detail that I should explain before I tell Steven's story is that a definite way to tell that you are seeing a wendigo or a skinwalker is if the animal or creature has two bright, glowing red or yellow eyes. One summer, about five to six years ago, Steven had a couple encounters with the Wendigo. His first encounter was on an earlier trip in the summer, where their destination was into Shoal Lake. It was a six-day trip, which had about 60 miles of paddling, and taking your packs and canoes over the land to another lake, into Shoal. On day four, they were going out of Shoal, through a portage called Headman's Portage. Sounds made up from some scary story. No idea why they call it that, but it's quite fitting. There was a campsite that is pretty frequently used, about half a mile from the portage. We just called the campsite Headman's. Steven and his trip left Shoal Lake aiming to get through Headman's Portage and stay at the campsite right after it. It's a little long, but a nice highway of portage without too many ups and downs. I believe the Canadian Park Service even clears out this portage, which may be the only one that is frequently maintained in the Lake of the Woods. The short paddle from the portage to the campsite is just surreal and beautiful. It's through a little stream, with 10 to 15 foot cliffs on both sides covered in moss and beautiful cedars. Stephen and his trip got to Headman's campsite, and later on, just before they were going to bed, they discovered they left their sleeping bag at the end of the portage. It was around 9, so it was getting pretty dark by this point. 
Stephen and a camper set off in a canoe with their headlamps quickly to retrieve the pack. The paddle took them about a half hour, and at this point you could really only see what your headlamp was shining on. They grabbed the bag and started to head back. Shortly after leaving, Stephen started to hear loud splashes and things falling from the water behind them. He dismissed it at first because beavers are pretty common in this area, and when they slap their tails it sounds pretty identical to a huge rock being chucked into the water. But the splashes kept going, and were right on his back as they kept paddling. Stephen looked behind him to see a huge rock around the size of a baseball come flying at him and land into the water at his side. They began to paddle like crazy to get back to the campsite and away from whatever was chucking these giant, super heavy rocks at them. Stephen looked back between the paddles and on one of the cliffs about 15 feet up, he saw two distinct red glowing eyes on top of it. The rocks stopped and they made it back okay. The rest of their trip went along nicely without any other occurrences. But I never feel great about going through Hedman's Portage. And triple check that I don't have any bags there when I do. This story takes place about two years ago. My aunt, married into the family, has cousins, not related to me, who live on a farm in La Pointe, Utah, on a reservation, and thought it would be fun to have all us other cousins go stay with her for a few days and see the Dinosaur National Monument. My aunt's grandmother had recently passed away, and her house was basically empty, so we went to stay there. It was a pretty old house, to say the least. It was made out of painted white cedar blocks and was pretty run down. But we were only staying there a few days, so we didn't care how luxurious it was. The front door led into a small kitchen, and off the kitchen to the right was a small room with a TV, two couches, and a chair. Off of that room was a larger living area with two more pull-out couches and a door leading to the side of the house. Off the living room was a hall that led into two small bedrooms and a bathroom. It was a pretty small house considering we had around 18 people staying there. Along with the old and empty house we were staying in, there were two other houses on the property belonging to my aunts, cousins, and their families. These were the only houses for about two miles. There were 12 kids in total, ranging from 3 to 16, me being the oldest, as well as the two other kids who lived in the other houses who wanted to come stay with us. We all slept on the pull-out couches and the floor. Other than the parents, there were two other people who were staying there. They were soon to be married, so they were staying there for a few days before the wedding. It was a whole big mess of people, but bear with me. They didn't want to sleep in the same house because they weren't married and religion and all this crap. So the guy, we'll call him B, was sleeping in the small camper outside while his fiance slept in one of the bedrooms. Now we can actually get to the creepy stuff. On the first night we were there, me and one of my cousins were on the pull-out couch in the first little room, while all the other kids were either on the other couches or on the floor, in either our room or the other. It was about midnight. Most of the kids were already asleep. We were watching Disney movies and dozing off when we started to hear strange noises outside toward the field. It sounded like low growling and panting, but not entirely like it was coming from an animal. There was just this weird, human-like sound to it. I assumed it was some sort of stray animal and got up to see when one of the other kids who lived next door, we'll call him L, jumped up and told me just to ignore it and go to sleep. I was really confused and the noises were still happening but the terrified look on his face told me I should listen. The creature would pace around the house and stop at the door by the kitchen for a few minutes before continuing to circle the house. Neither of us got any sleep that night. The next night was basically the same setup. Kids sleeping everywhere, movies playing, a few people still dozing off. I was exhausted from the night before and managed to fall asleep when I was woken up by one of the youngest kids quietly crying and crawling into bed with me. We'll call him A. I asked him what was the matter, and he said he was scared by the big dog outside the window. I turned to L and asked if they had a dog. He looked completely scared out of his mind and said no, and told me to ignore it once again. I stayed up for a while after that, watching movies with A, when he asked me to walk with him to the bathroom. A little bit of explanation before I continue. This house was shaped like a short L, the bottom part being the kitchen and the two living rooms and where it turns was the hallway with the bedrooms and the bathroom. The bathroom was right at the beginning of the hall. There was a small window to where you could see the wall, where the first living room was straight ahead along with the window that you could see through into the living room, where we were sleeping, and then the rest of the house to the left. Anyways, I was walking A to the bathroom and switch on the light when I see it. 
An extremely tall, dog-like creature standing on its hind legs facing the window looking into the living room. Its fur was matted and its eyes seemed to be almost glowing orangish red. Its hands looked human-like, but with dark fur and long claws. I screamed and the creature ran back around the side of the house on its hind legs. I picked up A and carried him back to the living room to quickly find L closing the curtains. What was that? I whispered to L. I don't know. If you ignore it, it'll go away, he whispered back. You've seen it before? Only a couple times, but not recently. Our talking woke up Elle's younger sister, and surprisingly, nobody else. I'm guessing she knew what was going on because she seemed just as scared as we were. I sat A down on the bed and turned the TV up louder, drowning out the sounds of the creature was making outside, and hoping to calm A down a bit and take our minds off whatever the hell we just saw. The noises circling the house continued for about another half hour, when they stopped at the back door in the other room. I peered my head around the corner to face the door. The door handle on the first door started to move back and forth. You could see the silhouette of something huge behind it. I rushed over to shut and lock the other door, trying not to wake anyone else. Just as I did, B, guy sleeping in the camper outside, also L's uncle, burst through the kitchen door, slamming it behind him. L asked B what was going on, but he didn't want to say another word and rushed down the hall and into the bedroom with his fiance. He came out holding a shotgun and pulled a chair into the corner of the living room, giving him a view of both the kitchen and the back door. He gave us a look of both terror and anger. He told us to go back to sleep. We didn't. He sat there all night until the noises stopped around sunrise, then went back outside into the camper without saying a word. I'm surprised no one else woke up, and no one else knows what happened that night. The next morning, there were huge paw prints around the house, and B was discussing something with Elle's dad who lived in one of the other houses. They both looked concerned and scared. It was very unsettling. We left later that day for reasons I can't remember, but I'm glad we did. I didn't want to spend another night in that house, and I'm pretty sure that what we saw that night was a skinwalker. This story belongs to a friend of mine. He told me this once and I simply have to tell it. My friend is of Native American heritage, a tribe who settled the North Pacific West Coast. He is quite the character. For one, he is a whopping 6 foot 10, and he has the blackest eyes you could imagine. He always has this frowning face going on, which makes him seem even more intimidating. He is everything but a bad guy. In fact, he is the most gentle of giants. He was working at a gas station up north back in 1992 and he pretty much always worked the graveyard shift from 11pm to 7am. Business wasn't exactly booming at nights, so he was usually watching TV or reading magazines between customers. And there were a few. The area he lived and worked in was deeply associated with all things Native American. There was a potent sense of pride in the surrounding communities, but also a very distinct presence of superstition and old traditions. My friend was no exception. He was a firm believer of the ways of old, this made his encounter even more terrifying. One night, he was sitting as usual, watching TV when a customer entered the gas station. The customer paid for his gas, a pack of smokes, and some soda and returned to his car. Nothing unusual. But my friend looked out the window toward the customer's car, and he spotted what looked like a huge dog sitting by the edge of the woods. Now, the window was located on the side of the building, some distance from the door, overlooking the pumps and the roof covering it. On the sides of the roof are pretty strong lights, which shine into the gas station. This gives the gas station not only an eerie lighting with the blinds casting long, striped shadows, but also blinds the teller to an extent. As he peered through the window, trying to focus on the dog, it was gone. He didn't think much of it, even if it was a wolf. He was inside and wolves don't tend to rob gas stations at night. Wolves were common here, but this wolf was huge. He brushed it off and returned to his mindless watching of TV. A couple of hours go by and not a single customer has entered since the last one. He was just about to refill some condiments when he heard a large thud coming from the back. It wasn't inside, he could hear that. But it came from the back. And behind the building, they kept the garbage. The gas station had been visited before by the scavenging homeless. But my friend didn't really care. It wasn't his garbage, and it was just garbage. Let them take it. But it kept getting louder. He decided to grab a flashlight and a gun from the office and circle around back to tell whoever ventured there to leave. His presence alone would have scared off anyone, but he wanted to feel safe just in case. 
He exited through the sliding doors, walking past the window he was just sitting by. As he turned the corner, he shines a light towards the dumpsters. As the cone of light hits the dumpsters, my friend instantly drops the flashlight and the gun. It's the huge dog he saw before, scouring through the garbage. It wasn't a dog, though. It clearly stood on its hind legs, reaching the same height as him. It couldn't be a bear, as it was too gaunt. The creature's eyes had been glowing in the light of the flashlight, making it even more terrifying. He ran inside the gas station and wasn't followed. He locked the door, stayed inside the whole night, and quit the next day. My friend is convinced that he saw a skinwalker, a shape-shifting shaman of sorts, which are a common occurrence in the Native American lore and culture. It's just a really creepy story. I'm not sure what to think of what happened. I may just be overthinking things, or my sister may have just been joking with me. I figured I would share my small story here, in case anyone had any insight on what happened. However, I don't quite believe anything is monstrous, as I suspect to be at fault. I probably just misheard. For perspective, I will tell you that I live out of the southern part of British Columbia, Canada. I live a good hour and a half away from the nearest town by car and my home is completely surrounded by forests with a few distant neighbors. It is not uncommon for us to see and hear coyotes, wolves, bears, and cougars, so we have a large dog for protection. However, the latest dog passed on, so our new protector is just a puppy and she's not very brave just yet, and I don't think she could have helped the situation if she wanted to. It happened the summer after my graduation. I got a call from one of my neighbors asking if I could tend to her garden while her and her husband went on a fishing trip. I took the walk down the hill with my dog through the brush so that she could lay out the details of specific care her plants would need. My family has known this woman since we moved into our home 20 years ago, and as children we would all go down and visit her, make her cards and chat, and she would allow us to play in her swimming pool in the summer. I trust her completely and have house sat for her before, so it was no odd request for my sister and I to go help out. The garden was new and absolutely beautiful. I have a garden of my own, but it was nothing compared to hers, which was gated and was in pristine condition. The mosquitoes were horrid, so she made her instructions short and I retreated back up the hill to inform my little sister of our assignment. The first day was terribly hot. My sister and I attempted to get up early to evade the heat and bloodsuckers, but in the end, they were all sitting in the shade waiting for us to arrive. It took a full hour and a half to completely soak the entire garden. And by then, we were sweating, bloody, itchy and irritable from all of our newfound bite marks. We were supposed to water the garden every morning so that the sun wouldn't dry up the water throughout the day. So I got up early to wake my sister, who after yesterday's assignment refused to go down with me, protesting that she wanted to sleep in and to leave her alone. Not wanting to be held responsible for the demise of my neighbor's veggies, I reluctantly trotted down the path to my neighbor's. Both my dogs were off on some squirrel-infested adventure, so my trek was made alone. Only a few birds that morning until I made it farther down, and the closer I got, the quieter it became. My attention, however, was on the sun, and I wanted to finish my task ASAP. When I was almost done, I took a stretch and went to turn off the hose, wiping the sweat from my forehead. Across the field, from the garden, I thought I heard a person, which would have been very odd, so I stood still to listen. What I heard was my sister calling my name in a shrill voice. My sister and I would often call each other in strange exaggerated screeches and voices in just that particular way. I knew for a fact that my sister is far too lazy to hike all the way down and sneak through the brush across the field just to yell at me. I listened again but heard nothing. Finishing up, I assumed I had just misheard, believing it to have been a bird or something, though the odd happening struck in my mind. Later on, I referred the account to my sister who laughed and joked with me that this must have been the creature her friend told her about. The creature she was referring to was called Wendigo, or Skinwalker. I honestly don't know the difference between the two. I don't know what these creatures are or if they actually exist, but if they were to, they're supposed to live in this kind of area. I put it out of my mind anyway, not believing in such things. The next day, I was with my sister tending the garden and my dog came down to see us. I was shocked to see her paw was all bloody thinking that she had cut herself on a piece of sheet metal. I ran with her back up to the house to see if I could clean and fix it. My sister didn't want to come up with me, so she stayed in the garden to finish up watering her part. It turned out the blood on my dog's paw was not her own, and that she had simply caught an unfortunate pack rat, whom she delightedly tore to pieces. 
When I came back, my sister wasn't in the garden. Confused, I began to walk to my neighbor's house when she came outside to meet me. She told me she had heard her name being called from across the field in my voice, in the same way I heard mine. She was visibly spooked and insisted we go back up to our house and leave the garden for tomorrow. I refused and told her she could go up without me if she wanted, but I had to finish the garden. I suspected she was only kidding with me, and I was waiting for her to give up right away, like she normally would. Instead, she stayed with me, holding her arms and refused to walk home alone. Once we finished, we both came back together for the next three mornings to water the garden, and no other occurrence has happened. To this day, my sister claims she wasn't lying. I'm not sure if these creatures are supposed to be smart enough or talented enough to pull off stunts so specific. We have lived in the same house in the middle of the woods for our whole lives, and we can be loud and silly without fear of annoying anyone. But if someone or something had been close enough to listen, they definitely had plenty of time to do so. Also, how these occurrences only happened when we were alone gives me goosebumps. If you have any answers for me, I would appreciate any info you have. I won't reveal who I am or much about where I live, and to be honest, it's been a few months since this happened, but I just came to terms with it now, and I have to warn people about what's out there, what they knew, what we don't. Warning, this is a very long read and some of the content below is very disturbing, but I can't hold back, so here's my story. Occasionally, I like to go hiking with my friends. There's not much more to do, honestly. We live in a small mountain town in Colorado. It was fun at first, but by now, we know the trails by heart. By the end of the summer, there was only one we hadn't tried. Now, there's a reason for that. The trail goes right through a portion of the forest that the Ute people consider to be sacred. I'll admit, I have hang-ups when it comes to these things. You don't wear hats in church. You don't let the American flag touch the ground. You don't trudge all over somebody's sacred land for the fun of it. Still, my friend, we'll call him Mark, convinced me to go. He said that regardless of whether I went, he'd go anyway. And since no one else was going, he managed to get me to go with him. That's one of my other hang-ups. Don't go hiking alone. Don't let friends go hiking alone. Too many tragic news stories start that way. So, I ended up going with him reluctantly. The whole way there, he was talking about how this was the coolest trail he'd ever been on. Yes, he'd been there before, though only once. His ploy had been to get me to come with him, so he could show me. He admitted this in the casual way that friends admit being jerks to friends. Sometimes, I didn't blame him. I had a tendency to have a stick up my butt, and what followed only reinforced it. We arrived at about 9, I remember, giving us plenty of time. It was farther away from the town than most trails, and it wasn't near a paved road, so there was a lot of walking just to get there. No tourist knew about it. A lot of locals and even some Ute didn't know about it. But if you followed a game trail through a bunch of trees, it would widen out and lead its way through some mountains, densely forested terrain. What struck me was how quiet it was. This, apparently, was what Mark found so awesome. For some reason, in this particular place, you couldn't hear any birds chirping or any wildlife whatsoever. It was complete and utter silence. Eventually, I had to go to the bathroom and I stepped off the main road, just so Mark wouldn't see me. As I was going, I spotted something through the trees. It looked like some sort of clearing, just past the shallow creek, with a log going over it. My curiosity got the better of me and I looked at the log. It didn't seem to be an act of nature. It was a makeshift bridge, I was sure. True enough, when I tested it, it seemed to be stable. I put one foot in front of the other and crossed. When I reached the other side, I pulled my way through some trees and saw the first image of the day that I will never forget. Though to many, it wouldn't have seemed like much. In front of me, there was vegetation, trees, ferns, brush. But suddenly, it all stopped. Within a perfect circle, surrounded by small, perfectly arranged rocks, there was nothing but smooth dirt. It was strange, not in the least because the shape of the rocks was absolutely perfect. They were partially submerged in soil and fit together like bricks. Every single one of them was the same, uniform white color. And as I got closer, I saw things had been carved on them. Symbols. They were old. Very old. Even if I had understood them, their distinct shapes had been lost over the years. That was strange, but what disturbed me was that this circle wasn't actually perfect. On one edge, just one, a group of rocks had been kicked up. They were scattered around, as if they actually had been in a perfect brick wall, and something shattered them. In this area, the otherwise perfectly smooth dirt had been kicked up, 
There was something about it that just unsettled me. As quiet as the entire forest was, it felt quieter here. I quickly turned around and went back to Mark, who made some lame old number two joke. I should have forced him to leave right there. Instead though, we kept going. After all, the day was only half over. While the forest itself was cool, at least Mark's perspective, I found the trail to be rather disappointing. It just went on and on. There was no alternate paths, and there was hardly any challenging terrain. For Colorado, this whole area was so flat, it was hardly a hike at all. The trail was just long, very long. It took us until noon to reach the end. There was no one else on it. I know that it was a hard trail to find, and many of the other locals might share my sentiments, but we were there all day and we didn't run into anyone. Of course, it wasn't until we reached the end that things started to get really weird. The trail didn't loop at all, and I inwardly groaned knowing that we would have to walk these same three boring hours back. We took our time eating our lunch. As we did, I swear I could hear noises for the first time. There were animals moving through the forest nearby. We could hear the rustling of the brush. I looked and saw through the foliage the vague outline of a single buck's head moving past us. It was odd, but I dismissed it. We packed up what was left of our lunches and start the trek back. Every once in a while, I would hear the rustling again. I'd look into the trees and oftentimes I would see the buck's head. Eventually though, I noticed it was making far too much noise, and it was doing so far too frequently. Mark told me to slow down and stop, and being Mark, he cracked a joke about it. But finally, he went silent, and we both still heard the rustling. Now even Mark was a little freaked out. He turned around and saw the vaguest outline of the buck's head again. This time to me, there seemed to be something wrong. The head was far too high up, around the higher branches of the trees. I noticed it. Mark didn't. I should have said something, but I didn't have time. Just as I was there, it was gone again, going off further into the forest. I remember Mark talking about how the deer was annoying as hell, about how he was going to scare it off or something. I don't remember exactly what he said, and that bothers me, because I should remember. He was one of my best friends. I do remember him yelling at it, and at the time, it was funny. Hey Buck, yeah, you, leave us alone. He walked off the road and disappeared down the ridge, behind a layer of trees pursuing it. For a minute, there was silence. That minute became two. Mark? I called out. No answer. Five minutes pass, I climbed down the ridge after him. Mark? I followed the general direction he had gone in, keeping the way back to the road in my mind. I wouldn't go far, I knew, because he was smart enough to not go far. He hadn't. After a short time, I found a place where there was no signs of struggle. In addition, there was blood. There was a lot of blood. It was all over the trees and all over the ground. I cursed to myself. There were other things too in addition to the blood. Pieces of flesh that I didn't like to look at. There were marks showing that something had been dragged away from here. Mark, I called out ferociously now. Forgetting the trail for a second, I ran forward, along the drag marks. After running too far to be safe, I reached a small ravine, with a creek running through it. I narrowly stopped myself. It wasn't a long drop, but it would hurt you, and a sprained ankle in the middle of the forest was bad news. The trail stopped here. Mark, I murmured, then called out again, Mark. I heard something, but it wasn't Mark. Across the ravine from me, I heard rustling and saw the trees stirring. Something stepped through the brush and revealed itself. It was the second image burned into my mind. Please give me a second. I've spent every single day for the past few months trying to tell myself it wasn't real. At first, I saw a head. A head of a buck. But it came forward and I realized that it was at least seven feet above the ground. I was staring at a seven foot creature straight in the face that had a massive buck's head, but a humanoid body. The creature snorted. Its buck face remained neutral, scared looking even, as if it wasn't sure of the malicious whims of the body beneath it. There was blood dripping from its horns, which were not like the horns of an average buck, but jagged, pointed, and unorganized. A mess of sharp points. Its human body was dark skinned and naked. I remember both of its arms and legs. They started human but near the bottom they distorted and became animalistic. At the end of its legs were powerful hooves. At the end of its arms were hands and very long claws, every bit as jagged as the horns on its head. In one of those claws was Mark's body being held by his shirt. I examined him only briefly, just long enough to notice that the shape of his head was not what it had once been. For a moment, there was silence. I didn't scream. I couldn't believe what was in front of me. Then the creature's ears ruffled. It dropped Mark and started backing up. Its deer head hung lazily to the side as it moved. 
My brain rang, suddenly. It's going to jump the gap. It's coming for me. With the logical side of my mind shut off, I turned around and ran, hopefully in the exact opposite direction the way I came. Behind me, I heard a powerful grunt, and then a scuffle of the monster landing on the bank. There was a horrifying roar. Something that sounded like a grizzly bear and a buck shouting together. I had never run so fast or so desperately in all of my life, but it was gaining on me. And as I ran through the forest, I started to feel its warm, hungry breath on my back. Its hands were extending and I swear I could feel its claws scratch me. I ran and scurried up the bank leading to the path. I don't know how I got there without it grabbing me, but I did. Then I took off down the road hoping I was going the right direction. While running, I threw off my backpack and gained some speed. I think the bank delayed it, slightly. That's the only reason I can account as to how I got in front of it. Somehow, I ran, and ran, and ran. I didn't stop. Eventually, I didn't hear it anymore. But I didn't care. I kept running. I have never been a long distance runner, but my adrenaline was not going to wear off anytime soon. I intended to take advantage of it. When I reached the end of the trail and saw the road again, I couldn't believe it. I got into my car. Just before I took off, I shot a glance back up the trail at the point where it went up between the two mountains, and was visible from the road. I would regret it. Standing there at the beginning of the trail was the Skinwalker, as I've come to call it. It had given up its chase, but stood there, watching me hungrily, waiting to see if I would come back. Its dear head hung lazily dead to one side. The blood on its body was beginning to dry. It had run the whole trail and didn't look tired at all. I twisted the ignition and floored the car and never came back. They never found Mark, and I would never explain what happened. No one would believe me. I thought I needed to tell someone, which is why I'm posting it here. It came back to me in my dreams, nightmares. That creature, the Skinwalker. Somehow, I doubt that forest was really sacred. In fact, I'm sure it was the opposite. Because the image that flashes through my mind most often is not the horrific creature. It isn't Mark's corpse. It's that circle which must have been maintained over the years by those who knew, those who understood, that old circle left alone for so long. I'm not being followed by anything other than my memories of that moment. That moment that felt like an eternity to me was clearly only a few seconds, but they were the most haunting seconds of my life. For a bit of context, I'm a Canadian university student currently living in central Quebec. Not like Montreal or anything, but a very small town bordering a very small city in the middle of nowhere. The landscapes are sort of an emerald dream, with titanic mountains jutting out aggressively, all of which blanketed in a dense forest. I love my town, everything's within walking distance. Friends, the bar, the lake, it's all great and nearby. So we often hit the town together. No need to drive anywhere or anything. Last night, we decided to have a little bonfire on this little ridge off the side of the lake, which doesn't really provide too much surface area for a bonfire. For this reason, the ten of us were huddled around a dimly lit campfire instead. Guitar is being played, fine alcohol is being drank, and good times are being had by all. As the night draws on, I've charged myself with keeping the bulk of the fire going. Nobody else is too apt at any sort of camping, or otherwise outdoorsy activities in my group. Up to this point, all was very normal, other than my close friends acting a little off. After our first few, he had ran out and left by himself to go get more. The ridge was out of sight of the road due to the dense forest paths that we used to get to and from it. So he goes and cuts through it alone. When he gets back, he's acting like he had a hundred beers. Looked like he wasn't used to his legs. Strangely enough, he had a full case of beer with him, so I assumed he hadn't drank any more. He also wasn't gone for very long at all. Honestly, we drank together often, me and him. I know what he's like drunk, and this was especially unusual. So he's trying to talk to the people, but he just can't say real words. It's as if he was trying to perform all of the accents of normal English speech, but didn't actually understand the words or syntax. Kind of like one of those videos that are meant to show what English might sound like to non-English speakers. As I mentioned before, the fire wasn't providing much in terms of light. So when we'd head off to go grab some firewood, I'd usually jerry-rig my cell phone flashlight to my belt to keep the area in front of me well lit. We do this a few times and some of the others begin to lose motivation to collect wood, so I take matters into my own hands for the last run of the evening. 
This brush was completely uncultivated, super thick, very dark. The only discernible paths that were about shoulder width were obstructed by an oddly fallen tree here and there. So I'm yanking at trees, trying to feel for anything dry. Even my phone light was falling behind waist level foliage. I didn't really have too much lighting. Once I got a handful or so, I figured it'd be good enough for the last burn so I get the idea to head back. But just as I get this thought, my phone falls straight onto the ground. So of course, it had to land face down, blocking the flash, preventing me from finding the right way. Regardless, I didn't look for it immediately. For some reason, I decided to let the darkness sink in. I had never been in such a dark environment that I was unable to see my hand in front of my face. Even the brightest moonbeams couldn't breach the canopy above. However, as I focus on my surroundings, I quickly realize I was referencing my frame using a subtle glow. It was yellowish but twisted into a green color the more I concentrated. I was immediately very startled by its lack of movement, yet curious. I hesitantly paced inward, carelessly leaving my phone on the ground. The glow split distinctly into two yellow-green bulbs that were locked onto each other. They're my eyes. My vision is really bad, especially with lighting, so from a distance my eyes will merge the source of light together. For instance, I can't see stars. This caused my curiosity to go nuts. What kind of fat raccoon is trying to stalk me through these bushes? Something was hitting me though. I was terrified. I bore a fear so intense that my stomach began to churn. My curiosity has always outweighed my fears, and this situation was no different. I began to know what it was. It began to know me. There was this very strange bond in that moment that chilled me to the core. I felt a connection to this living thing, but its eyes were pumping fear into my body. The worst mistake I'd ever make is to follow. Nervously, I yelled loud enough to attempt to startle whatever it may have been in this chilling stare down against me at only about a 7 or 8 foot distance. Its absolutely motionless reaction to my help began to chip away at my sanity. Was I staring at two elaborately placed lights in the middle of the woods? No, it couldn't be. They had eyes, and this battle cry didn't even make him flinch. Because of that, part of me rationalized that it could not possibly be any animal. It's probably some kind of prank, or a marker for some type of ecology job. So I pressed towards it again, walking as if I knew for sure that this was all to be logically explained. As I closed the gap, my vision began to home in on these lights. Plainly defined ovals, resplendent with the brightest darkness I'd ever felt. When they were legitimately just out of my range of clear vision, the lights, which were waist level before, rose up. They rose as eyes would on a bear standing onto its hind legs, instantly reducing me to a quivering mess. Odd thing is, bears don't have antlers. I haven't ever heard of a moose with piercing eyes that can stand on its hind legs either. As soon as it began straightening up, I was already getting out of there. I just ran. Luckily, I managed to kick my phone out of the dirt and quickly picked it up. The flashlight was still going, making it really easy to spot once I kicked it. Rolling through the woods, illuminating phone now in my hand. I made it back to my campfire completely out of breath. Now, normally I'd spray this story all over my friends, but I knew they'd just think I'd went crazy or hit my head collecting wood. Also, considering I didn't have a bundle of sticks anymore, my shortness of breath was probably a little unjustified. I sat down and noticed that my friend from before was still being very strange, but it seemed like with every passing minute he was adapting more to the conversation and was steadily attempting to contribute more and more. We're all good friends, which is why I find this unusual, considering the fact that he legitimately could not speak English one minute, and then within 15 he's practically back to normal. Still, something was off. He was the last to leave the campfire, even after the other guys had pissed it out, and he just stayed there staring at the ashes. After most of us had gotten home, he calls me. An entire minute of silence. The whole time I'm shouting at him to tell me where he is and that if he's too drunk to get home, I'll go and find him. Disturbingly, he just hangs up. After a cigarette and another half a beer, he calls me back again. This time, he's trying to talk like before, but he can't pronounce any words again. He never did touch that case of beer he brought, by the way. Just sat next to him during the whole fire. So I tell him to stop being an idiot and to tell me where he is. He hangs up again, leaving me to figure that he's just drunk, emotional, and that maybe I was just being a little too harsh on him. Honestly though, I was just so shaken up and I needed to confide to somebody about what I had just seen. But he was incapacitated and it frustrated me. 
After that, I went to bed and I figured he was just being strangely drunk. It was insanely weird to me, but I had a few drinks too and I wasn't really having any of his crap and I figured I'd try to get some sleep. When I wake up in the morning, I have a text from his roommate asking me why he saw him crawl from underneath his car in the driveway this morning. We haven't seen him since, and his roommate said he thought he'd never made it home because he didn't come in. So, what's wrong with my friend? I'm hoping he comes back because if he doesn't, my buddy just got his skin and carjacked by a flesh gate or something. So now I'm scared. Sorry for the long post, I just needed to vent and tell the story properly as I remember it. Update. He came back home around 8.30pm last night looking a little shaken up, but otherwise normal. He seems fine for now. This happened last night, so for the past two days, I've been reading a lot about skinwalkers. I've scourged the top posts of all time and read every single story from there, and also the local news for skinwalker stories. I live in NWT. It's the province about Alberta, about 200,000 in population, beautiful in the summer. We're surrounded by the woods and lots of lakes. There's one particular trail people often drive to access said lakes. Anyway, last night I was driving on the trail with a guy friend to find a secluded spot. He recommended V Lake, which was the first lake you access on the trail system. The way it's set up, there's a long narrow dirt road at the right of the highway that you have to drive for at least 20 minutes before you get to the lake itself. The dirt road is surrounded by trees and is riddled with little lakes here and there. It's my favorite lake to drive to, mostly because I love the narrow dirt roads with lots of tall trees. So it's Sunday night and we're the only ones driving. We weren't high or drunk, we were just having fun, listening to music. Then as I was driving, about 10 minutes into the dirt road, an extremely strong smell of rotten flesh filled our noses. This weirded my friend out and made me panic. The first thing that came to my mind was skinwalkers. It was vile and the smell just hit us all of the sudden. The windows were closed and the AC was set to the lowest. The car is clean and nothing there could have caused it. I asked him what he thought of the smell. He said barbecue. I told him there's a current fire ban in effect in the city. That can't be. He agreed and he said it smelled really rotten to him. The smell was strong, it was making me nauseous. I'm now more aware of the woods surrounding us, how it actually makes me feel kind of claustrophobic, how every turn and curve makes me more and more anxious. My gut was telling me something isn't right and I kept thinking skinwalkers and the stories I've read up for the past two days. I was getting more scared by the moment. Then we drove through another curve and my lights and high beams shone quickly on a person standing inside the mouth of the woods, and that's when I panicked. I asked my friend, do you still want to drive down this road? Yeah, I don't care, he replied. During this time, I seriously knew something wasn't right and my brain kept screaming at me to turn around. I kept glancing at my mirrors. Frank Ocean's voice wasn't calming me down. I was so scared. I think he saw my discomfort so he piped up again. We can turn around if you want. I slammed on my brakes and did a four point turn and hightailed it out of there. Once we were back on the highway of the trail, I told him about what I thought of the smell, but not the person I saw in the woods. I didn't want to freak him out. We had a long conversation about it, I knew we shouldn't have, but he kept asking questions because he was curious, so I answered, but tried not to mention its name. Also, while we were there, we were parked at the picnic ground of a lake, and little stones started hitting the driver's side of the truck. A couple would hit every minute or so. It unnerved the crap out of me, but I ignored it. There was no one else in the trail, because we didn't hear or see anyone driving. That was kind of weird too. One statement of his that kind of unnerved me was, I think it was trying to lure us further into the woods. So, on the way back, I had him drive so I could calm down. I was calmer on the drive back. There were some foxes with glowing eyes in the middle of the road that kind of freaked me out at first, but then I realized they're just foxes. Also saw roadkill by the immediate side of the road that wasn't there before, which was pretty weird. It was about the size of a beaver, but really nothing to panic about, I think. So yeah, this all happened from 1 to 3 AM last night. I now really believe in skinwalkers, just wasn't expecting on encountering one. 
My uncle, aunt, and all my cousins live in Utah, like two states over from me, California. They drive around a lot, especially for family reunions. My uncle often tells all the kids and everyone else a story when we go camping, mostly since someone usually wants to hear it again. He was driving back home alone one night in the summer. He knew the area well and he wasn't worried, but he was still kind of creeped out from, well, driving alone at night. He was in a long road of that sort of sparse, deserty area with the hills and bushes. My uncle then heard a weird noise, like a chirp or something. The way he described it was the first part of the hee-hee that Michael Jackson makes, without the second he. It sounds very ridiculous, I know, but unsettling in the cold, dark outdoors. And it seemed clear enough to not have just been creaking metal, or something like that. Obviously, he got a little weirded out by it. He's a lively, tough dude with the company of others, but he hates being alone. My uncle heard it from somewhat far away, but then he started hearing it again, and it was almost ramping up, getting faster. It was also getting slightly louder. He sped up, but it still continued to get closer. He looked to the left outside his window and saw something running almost parallel to his truck, pretty far off the road but inside the bush area, upright like a tall, skinny human. He said it was brown and furry, and it just bothered him. It wasn't horror movie monster scary, but it was something's wrong scary. He heard the moving of leaves. The noise was now basically constant. It sounded different, like a person sounds when they're tired and speak every syllable in one breath of air. The animal thing sort of faded into the plants. The thing was though, he didn't feel any less scared, since now he feared it was in front of him, and that he would see it clearly on the road, but nothing happened for the rest of the ride. He usually clears out the night with his story. Camping stories are fun, but they're sort of harmless. This one gets everyone creeped out and thinking. Something that wouldn't have gone away if he told the story earlier. For a little background on my story, I live in a small town outside of Kansas City, Kansas. But the area I live in has lots of history around it, and there was a lot of Native American activity in the area. My house has a long driveway, and is in the middle of a stand of woods. The woods have been there as long as there's records of the area. When we first moved into our home, everything seemed pretty normal. But after living there a month, that's when abnormal stuff started to happen. Pounding on the roof, animal scratches on our vehicles, and we started finding a lot of dead animals on the property. We even contacted Kansas State Game Wardens, but couldn't find any evidence of poaching or poisoning, or even the animals getting hit by cars. So after about two years of this, my older brother moves back in and brings his dog with him. One night at about 11pm, the dog starts whining to be let out. So I put him on the leash and let him walk around the yard. Suddenly, he starts trying to yank me back towards the house. This uneasy feeling washes over me and I notice something that smells like rotting catfish guts. I feel like someone was watching me so I turn around. And down by our garage, just inside the light, I see this figure. It was about five feet tall, hunched over, and it was very pale. It had small, deep, beady eyes and had a deer-like face. A sense of pure terror washed over me. I've never been more scared of anything in my life, and to this day, I've never felt that level of fear. I ran back into the house to wake up my dad and brother. They grab some shotguns and run outside to check it out. All they find are some pretty deep scratch marks on the garage. We contacted the game wardens the next day. I described what I saw and smelled and they said it was probably a very sick deer that had contracted some sort of illness or something of that sort. Weird stuff kept happening for another two or three years. Then we had a really bad drought and stuff stopped occurring. So I don't know what the hell I saw that night. I was wondering if anyone had seen or smelled anything similar to that. <laughs> 